want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to go to 34 today. And uh, we're talking about back to the book. And you probably haven't got grasped onto what's the book. Why isn't he calling it the Bible? It is the Bible. And the passage that we're reading right now, they found the book. Um, changed them. They, had, they always had the book. We, we've always had the book. It's just a matter of what we do with it. I want, I want to talk about that. I've thought about this. I've always been fascinated with revivals, the Great Awakening, uh, different names throughout history that they've used for the Great Awakening, the Great Revivals that they had. Uh, one of them in particular that a lot of people remember, uh, it's for like history, historical sense of it, it was the 1730s and 40s, the ones that we read about probably the most. Through the 13 colonies and through Britain, uh, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, these men would travel from city to city. They were, they were stirred up. The, the state of society had become so apathetic to the things of God and the, the more freedoms they got, the more apathetic they became. They got distant from God. They got cold. There wasn't anybody seeking after God. It was just a matter of just being complacent. And that's easy. It's, it's a comparison of where we're at today. And, and, and seeing the picture, I think Richard has one of the pictures that this is just kind of an image. They would go to a town and they would set up what they called scaffolding or a platform that was just makeshift stage high enough for people to see them. They oftentimes didn't have ampl- amplification or anything like that. And they would just get up there and they would just take the word of God and they begin to just bring people back to what mattered, back to what they lost, back to what they got away from. And the Bible is, is so powerful in the fact that sometimes, guys, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm thankful for us having screens that everybody can see, and I'm thankful for chairs that we can sit in, I'm thankful for the pulpits that we can use, and the illustrations, the instruments. The power of God does not lie within any of these things. Do we need them? Yes. Are they tools? Yes. Thank God for heat. Thank God for buildings. Thank thank God for nurseries and check-in systems and all. But I want you to know the power of God does not lie in material things. And sometimes we put our whole church experience into what entertains us or what awakens our senses of, of, oh, I like that, and that was cool, and that video was nice, and, and all these things that are, are tools or add-ons, but they're not the main thing. And these men would stand before them, and they would just preach God's word. One of the famous messages from this era was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. History tells us that he literally took his message, he laid it on the pulpit and he looked down without even looking in the audience and he began to read from top to bottom about the sin of society and how man has drifted from God. And the Bible is so powerful. Not Jonathan Edwards. Not the platform. But the word of God that began to penetrate the hearts and the minds of the people that were there. It wasn't hype. It wasn't emotionalism. Just straight up conviction. And the, and the history tells us that as they began to hear the words of God in their pew, they began to grip the back of the pew and begin to cry out in different areas for God not to let them go to hell. And an awakening began to happen where people began to turn from the wicked ways and turn back to God. You say, what has happened? I don't see that today. I, I, when I was a kid I, I, and a teenager growing up, I went through different glimpses of, of, of times I've been in services where I can tell you, and I can't even explain it. Don't ask me to put it into words. I can't. Unless you've been there, you can't where I've been in services where the preaching happened and before the message was over, people began to come forward and weep. And I, I remember as a kid going up to the altar and I'd, I'd be able to see the spots. And by altar, I, I literally mean a place to pray. It's not about where you pray, it's who you're praying to, the very fact that you are doing it. 
in the heart of what you're doing where you look up and say, God, I need you so bad. Something's missing. And I remember seeing literally where you could see tears, wet marks in the chairs and in the, on the altar and on the carpet. I, I remember people gathering to pray and going into the service. And they begin to sing songs. And as they're singing songs, people begin to come to the altar. And by the end of the night, people were saved. And I know this because I was in one of those services that I got saved. You say, what was it like? It was, it was like, and, and I'm not being charismatic or weird or whatever, but uh, sometimes we downplay the working of the Spirit of God. Do you guys understand that the Word of God is powerful and the Spirit of God moves? It does. It goes out and it hits the hearts of people. We sit there and say, I, I don't know what's wrong with my kids and my husband's so cold to this and my, my wife is apathetic and my, nothing gets through to my kids. Nothing will get through to your kids like the Word of God. Nothing will change your husband like the Word of God. The priority of the church, the priority of your life, the priority of your family has to be the Word of God. There is no substitute. We can have a song service. We can watch our videos. We can hear the announcements. We can promote our activities. But nothing replaces the Word of God. And a nation or a church that gets far removed from the Word of God gets stagnant and dead and cold and apathetic I gave this illustration last week, and I was talking about Adam and Eve, of how they had, the, we talk about the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus, He had God. God spoke to them, don't do this, and this is what I want, walk with me in the garden. And The serpent came up to Eve and said, hey, did God really say? And Satan so there and says, you know what? Maybe there's more to life. Maybe you're missing out on something. You know, have you ever thought that there's something else out there? She turned. There's, there's a danger. When God's people begin to turn their attention, their focus from the Word of God to the other things, to the influences of the world, whether it's Satan or society or whatever it is, when we turn from God and we turn to the temptations or the world or sins of the world, bad things happen. The Bible says that she saw that the fruit was good to eat. It changed her perspective. There was the presence of sin that was presented and that presence of sin brought a practice of sin. She took the fruit. And the Bible tells us, this. it explains that there's a progression of sin. It never just stops. It's never good enough. It will never just end. It never will be. Nothing will ever just end with sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Sin in your marriage Sin in your mind, sin of pornography, sin of bitterness will not stop until it destroys you. Thorns and thistles came as a result of that. The Bible talks about this torment that was there. They were removed from the garden. They were removed from the fellowship that they had in pain and suffering. A great Peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend you. Do you guys understand that great peace in the world that we live in, and I'm not just saying the world, I'm talking about church and society and families, young people and teenagers and parents, husbands and wives of our culture in this room, in this building, in our day and age, are lacking peace. Something's off. I think we're caught in the middle. I'm not saying that we're out in adultery. We're not in idolatry. And we're out 
Well, I was going to say killing babies, but our nation's doing that. Not as bad as Manasseh. Second Chronicles chapter 33. The Bible says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not eat of the fruit. Today it's different. That thou shalt not was anything that opposed God and turns our attention over here. Guys, I'm just going to shoot you straight. If, you're, if I offend you this morning, it's not me offending you, it's just truth, okay? It's just truth. Sometimes we squirm because we hear things that go against what we do or what we have in our life and we get so upset. Do you understand that Satan will mess with your head all day long and say, you don't want to be around that preacher, that church, da, 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 da. He'll do anything he can to pull you from the word. To get you to turn to everything else. See, we, I, I'm using the illustration of the apple, but I'll tell you, in Manasseh's day, they were false gods. They would build these idols up and they were an abomination. You know what an abomination is? It's something that morally goes against God. Something that turns our head against God. I begin to think about what our culture is. In our culture, the Bible says clearly that thou shalt not commit adultery. It's, it's actually one of the Ten Commandments that he, that he gave us, that he put into our lives for our protection. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus was teaching. He was talking to the people and he began to get on this issue. And in Matthew 5, 28, he took it to the next level. And he said, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He was saying this. He said, I'll tell you what. I've got a plan for your life and I've got a plan for men and I've got a plan for purity and I've got a plan for teenagers. And he said, I'm, I'm going to explain to you this. When you turn and you look upon a woman to lust after her in your heart, you have committed adultery. You realize that the world, the very thing that I'm talking about, they view as entertainment. You guys realize that in the culture that we live in, adultery and looking at a woman is what they put in magazines and on TV and movies. And our society is saturated with this. Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the works of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Years ago, we, we, we lived in a, a society that people would have to seek out to look at things that were wrong. Pornographic materials. It's never been more convenient in all of our lives. Today, there was proven men ministries that conducted a search by the Barna Research Group and statistics for young Christian men that said 77% of them look at pornography at least monthly. 36% of them view pornography on a daily basis. 32% of them admitting to being addicted to pornography. We have this society, and I've heard this myself. You guys have heard this. Well, Tony, you're just not going to get away from it. That's just the world that we live in. It is the world that we live in. I'm not going to deny that. But the law or the way that I am to live is not according to the world, but according to God. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You understand that the very principle that God was given us when it came to this, that we have turned and said, this is just the way that it is. And Satan is so subtle. Because I don't, I don't care saying these things. It doesn't bother me in a bit, because I see the results of it. It disgusted me when I saw that, I don't have a picture of this or whatever, there, there was a movie, a superhero movie called Deadpool. It came out with Deadpool Part 2. Deadpool Part 2, one of their advertisements was a reenactment of Jesus coming back through the clouds and he's like this with all the characters in, his, in the white room and, and you, you can look it up. It's, it's an actual advertisement. 97 F-bombs that they drop in there. GD throughout the whole thing and nudity. 
And yet Christians will say, well, it's just entertainment. It's just funny. Let me explain. It's just sin. Amen. It's sin. But in our culture, we've been so sucked into it. When God says, don't look at another man's wife naked. Don't lust upon her. Do not take God's name in vain. All the things that God has said, and we turn around in our culture, the same, we look at it Manasseh's day and say, well, they were crazy. They were worshiping false gods. God said, I said, thou shalt not to these things as well. We just justify them. It's a popular TV, well, HBO show called Game of Thrones, and they've gone on for like eight seasons or something crazy like that. And I read an article that was published warning Christians, and they said that they bragged on the fact that there's so many sex scenes in it that they actually had to hire porn stars to do the sex scenes. And they said one of our objectives is one day to put a hurting on the porn industry because people are getting so much of the porn just from watching Game of Thrones. Yet we have Christians walk through the doors of churches and sit there and say how great is our God and how great thou art and we worship you God. We wonder why there's anxiety. We wonder why there's stress. Let, Let me explain it. The Bible says that no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other The the Bible says Elijah was standing before them and he said, how long will you halt between two opinions? Either you will serve the gods of Baal or you will turn to God, but no man can do both. The Bible explains to us that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Do you understand? You cannot put in our life an idol of worship or attention of pornography or lust or like just put whatever it is. It's bitterness and you're walking around all bitter and mad and angry and you're mad at this and you're mad at that and you walk in church mad and you walk out of church mad. You've got those people that you're mad at and you're mad at them and mad. That's bitterness. God said, may it be removed from you because I died to set you free from that. Lust, anger, greed. I'm not just highlighting one sin, although I think these, some of these sins are like coming over our nation as a wave. And we wonder. There's no revival. Because we're here. I, I, I come to church and I hear it. And I want to worship God. And I come on Monday night, I'm watching my show and it goes against God and it does things that are wrong and I know that and we're, we sit there and we're, we're, we're bobbing back and forth a double minded man is unstable emotionally unstable stressed out no peace because great peace have they that love thy law if this is peace what is this Guys, let me, let me let you in on a little secret. You say, well, I'll tell you what, my home life isn't right. That's why I watch this stuff. All this stuff. You get your life lined up with this, and I promise you, your marriage will line up too. You want to find a wife that falls in love with you? You fall in love with the Word of God and watch your actions and attitudes line up with God and see what happens. The Bible warns us about the sin in our society and the sin in our life. The Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season. It's, it's not that there's not the thrill or the fun, or, but I tell you, it, it corrupts the minds of men to the point where they go to their wives and there's no satisfaction. They don't level up. They don't add up because they've been perverted. That's what the word perverted means. It means to twist. We have a twisted perspective of sex. A twisted perspective of our spouses. A twisted perspective of life. And we're miserable. Not even to mention. I haven't even got on the whole fact that we're not experiencing revival and people being saved and and, and the word of God working because God steps forward. The spirit of God opens the door to the back door of churches and looks inside and says, there's so much dirty minds and filth. You cannot drag it into your mind on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Monday and fill our minds full of the garbage of the stuff of this world and expect revival in our homes on Monday. 
The Bible says very clearly, you be holy for I am holy. Have we lost sight of that? I mean, holy means to remove sin, to not have sin. I'm not saying that we're ever going to accomplish sinless perfection. If a man, as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to war with the flesh. There's a big difference, guys. There's a big difference between being tempted and just giving in. There's a big difference between flipping through and being tempted and then, or, or the, the, the opposite of sitting there and watching the show and letting it go into your mind. It's wrong. We could do a huge favor to our lives and our families if we would stop asking God for revival. And we started asking God for forgiveness. Because revival comes to those that are purified and cleaned and emptied out and ready. God cannot fill dirty vessels. God cannot fill dirty minds. God cannot revive that which is living in sin and loving it. I know I've taken a long time with this, but I just, it's, it's so heavy on my mind. I want you to see something. The Bible says in Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You sit there and say, well, that was a great movie. God says, whoa. Whoa. Warning to those that could sit there and say that was good when God said it's bad. Whoa. Do we not hear the warning as Christians and fathers and leaders? Do we not Hear the warning of God when God says, and we've passed down the generation to generation. So there was Manasseh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. He built up the groves, he built them up. The Bible says that he even drug the, he drug the altars into the house of God. Set it up there and he worshiped the false gods. It wasn't, wasn't the apple, it was the false gods, but it was, it was this equivalent of the apple. It was the equivalent of pornography. It was the equivalent. It was things that were abomination that went against God. Manasseh went so far that he actually took the very places, if you would, at the Old Testament churches, and he drug that sin smack into the middle of it, the same way that we do when we watch sin or have sin and we drag it into our hearts and our minds. It's the same thing. They were sacrificing their kids to the gods. They were worshiping false gods because they allowed the world. They didn't just jump up there and say, hey, throw away everything you believe and go over there. No, it's a slow fade. It, it starts with the turn and the direction and the change of the mind. That's why the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Manasseh has a son called Ammon. Ammon was 22 years old at the end of 2 Chronicles 33 when he began to reign. He only lasted two years. The Bible says that he was more wicked than his father. How wicked would you have to be when the wicked people thought you were so wicked that they knew that the only chance of hope for them was to kill the king? So the servants rose up and they killed that king. But before that, he had a son named Josiah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of his father and declined neither to the right nor to the left. Verse 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God of David his father. See, for so long they were caught in the middle. Oh, we worship the father or the God of David, and yet they were worshiping God or claiming God or having the temples or their godly heritage on one minute, and yet they were worshiping the idols on the next. Josiah, being sick and tired of it, eight years old, when he began to seek after God, something in his heart and mind told him that it does not have to be this way. Can I tell every person here, it does not have to be this way. The first thing that he began to do, the Bible tells us that Josiah began to seek after God. So simple. I mean, I, I, I tried to 
complicate this. I try to figure out what, what does that mean and what does it mean to seek after God? The, the, the Bible literally means when it comes to the word seek, it means to pursue, to ask, to want. It's for us in our lives to simply say that, hey, listen, all the sin and the things that I'm doing, the entertainment, and not having joy in my marriage and not being able to lead my family and not having revival in my heart, not seeing people saved, not seeing altars filled, not seeing lives transformed, not seeing all these things. And Josiah says, wait a minute. It doesn't have to be this way. Do you remember your David, your grandfather? Remember the story about how God brought down a giant with just a stone? Just a stone? It was God. The Bible says that Josiah began to seek after the, the God of David. Tell me more. Tell me more. What do you mean? Jonathan Edwards preached a message and people cried out for revival. Tell me more. What do you mean that God can work in such a way to save my wayward husband or my kids that are doing wrong? What do you mean? Tell me more. God was working. And Josiah began to have something come over him that wasn't normal, that wasn't there before. He said, tell me more. The Bible says that he began to seek after God. The, the, the very word means to ask, to pursue, to want, to desire. It doesn't mean that we have all the answers. But it means just like Eve, when she saw that the food was good, we sit there and say, I'm sick of the food. I'm sick of the trash. I'm sick of the dead. I'm sick, I'm sick of the apathy. I'm tired of it. What would happen if Fellowship Baptist Church and the members of Fellowship Baptist Church just began to go, I, I want more. Satan, you are a liar. That doesn't satisfy. It's not filling. It's not good. I want more. And how we got it? This change of being caught in the middle was to turn around and begin to say, God, what do you want? Jesus was teaching the disciples, and he said, ask, listen to this, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open to you. You know why a lot of times in society, in our life, in Christian culture today, we sit there and say, that sounds good, but it doesn't work. Let me explain to you why. When our lives are lined up with this and we're saying, God, I need a job. God says, get your heart right. God, I need this. I'm knocking. God says, you're knocking in the wrong places. When our lives align with the word of God and you ask God to fix your marriage or your life or your kids or whatever, things change because here's where the power lands. And a lot of times we're just going through the motions of things and Man Manasseh didn't do it. Amen didn't do it. Just side began in his heart to ask the question, what does God say? Ask the question this week. Ask the question today. Ask the question and invitation today. What does God say? Because a lot of times in our sin, everybody else is doing it. It's no big deal. And you're old-fashioned. And that, that doesn't make sense. And that's just the way I was brought up. And that's that pastor that says that. And da, 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 da. It's, it's all rules. He said, she said. But man, things change when you turn your head and say, God, what do you, what do you want? Lord, is this, is this right? Because society says that I can live with my boyfriend and have premarital sex and I, I, I'm okay because that's just how society says. But you said that marriage is honorable and all. Is this wrong? God, what does it say about getting things right? Because I have bitterness against somebody for a long time and I have anger and I can't even worship in church without being upset or it coming to my mind. And What should I do with it? He began to seek after God. God made us a promise. He said in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah was the prophet that was preaching during the time of Second Chronicles and Kings and those passages. The prophet was saying, then shall you call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. He said, ye shall seek 
me and find me. Then you shall search me with all your heart. Did you notice the promise of what God says? You will seek me. And you know what God said? You will find me. And a lot of times where we say those types is ambiguous. It's just like, what does that mean? Where is it going with that? Let me explain to your church what you'll find. Because Jesus is peace. You'll find peace that you could not find in anything of the trash of this world. You're trying to be satisfied with the junk and the movies and the show and the entertainment. You'll find satisfaction because God is the one that satisfies us. You will find the peace that passes all understanding. You will find the joy that you can't find in there. You might find it temporarily in the world, but you'll find it permanently in God. And you do know that there's a difference between joy and happiness. I get excited when my team wins a football game, but joy is something in my heart that I know that never leaves because God is constant. In this world that is missing something is because they're not seeking God and they'll never find it. We can preach to the world all day long about how they're looking in the wrong places. Are we looking in the wrong places? I'm going to wrap it up with the rest of that verse in 2 Chronicles. The Bible says that Josiah began to seek after the God of his father. In the 12th year, he began to listen to this. You know what happens? Watch what happens. You talk about change. How do you get out of the middle? This is what happens. In the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten image. Happiness comes when you seek after God or change happens when you seek after God. Change happens when you purge your life. The word purge means to be pure, to make oneself clean. You see, the closer you get to God, You don't have to be told what needs to go. You don't have to be told. God begins to work in your life and you realize what needs to change. Look at those next verses. This is what happens in Chronicles as he begins to seek after God, after he begins to do this, and he realizes, he goes in there and he finds the pornography. He finds the bitterness. He finds the anger. He finds all the things that God said should not be there, the things that we call entertainment, things like that. And you say, no, he found the groves. It's just different in our society. And they break him down. The altars of Balaam in his presence and in the images that were in the high above them, and he cut them down in the groves and the carved images, the molted images, and he breaks them into pieces. You know why? It's not that I just want it out. I want it. I want it dead. I was telling the teenagers, you know what Goliath What happened to Goliath after David knocked him down? He cut off his head. Those giants in our life of lust and greed and everything else will creep back into our lives. You knock them down and you get them out. And he strode it upon the graves of them and sacrificed unto them. He was sick of it. When he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder, he cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel and he returned to Jerusalem. You guys want to see revival happen in our nation? That's when we get a hold and we seek after God and we begin to want God in our lives and we turn over here and say, you know what, there's some things in my life that has to go. Purge literally means to clean. You guys understand that there's some things in our life that God says does not line up and God says it's time to get them out. I'm talking about revival. I'm talking about a change. I'm talking about overcoming the problems in our life and the anxiety and the stress and the depression and all these things that come. And I'm not saying that that, that these things aren't real and they just go away. I'm saying that it begins with our hearts being right with God that we clean house. How in the world is God going to work in our lives when we're building up altars of sin in our lives and we're allowing them to reign there? How mad do you have to be like Josiah to walk in there and say, you know what? Get it out knocked him over stomping in the pieces it's ruined us I don't have a dad today I don't have a grandfather today because Josiah was saying because that sin ruined them when you see what it does to our society and guys it's an awful thing that our nation is now okay with killing babies nine months in the womb and be able to kill a baby that's disgusting can I let you in on a little secret They're not as bad off as we are. Because we know the truth. 
They're in darkness. They're in darkness. I'm not justifying it. But how dare we sit there and say, well, because they had sex and they, they didn't want that baby. They killed the baby and they feel like they have the right. We're over here looking at another man's wife naked and we're lusting after her and that's okay. I'm having sex with my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever and that's okay. I shack up with somebody and they're not even my wife, but I'm sleeping with them and that's okay. And all this stuff goes against God, but we're going to sit there and pitch a fit with what they're doing. It's a progression of sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will mess up your family and mess up your life. I have something going on in my heart that I want to see God work. I want to see a change. I don't want to hype. I don't want a banner. I don't, I don't want, I, I, don't, I want to just a touch of God. I, I want God to speak to my kids in a way that it's not me. I want God to work in services where I could walk out of there and say, today we met with God and God met with us. I, I want to see God use Fellowship Baptist Church to stir up our city. He said, it's not the great awakening. It can be in us. It started with just one or two. It can start with us. The word that comes to mind is repent. It's the change direction and seek after God. And as you get closer to God, he begins to say, get this out, change this. We begin to purge our lives and allow God to come in.